There's a lot of mystery surrounding those three wise monkeys. You know the ones I'm talking about. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Well, today I'm going to tell you about some curious history I discovered involving our three furry friends. It involves bugs, corpses, six-armed deities with blue faces, and staying awake all night every 60 days so your life doesn't get shortened. And also, there's a fourth monkey. Uncanny Japan is author me, Teresa Matsura, exploring all that is weird from old Japan. Strange superstitions and old wives' tales, cultural oddities and interesting language quirks. These are little treasures I dig up while doing research for my writing, and I want to share them with you here on Uncanny Japan. I hope you like the show. Hey, hey, everyone. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Rich Pav and I are insanely busy getting the new podcast up. He's been working on an adorable video introducing me and both podcasts for Patreon, among the other hundreds of things that he's doing. I've been working on this show, Bedtime Stories, reading through potential pieces for the Soothing Stories podcast, and recording all of that. Oh yeah, before I forget, I wanted to mention that most of the transcripts to the shows are up on the Uncanny Japan website. They used to be in the RSS feed too, but that got a little unwieldy. So if you're missing those, just go to the episode you're looking for on uncannyjapan.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and there they'll be. I'm also trying to put up more and more of the kanji that I talk about, the Japanese words, and actually in Japanese for each episode too. So if you're like me and you like to study those characters, that's there as well. Okay, let's turn on some late winter rain and talk about monkeys. First, can I tell you about the coolest monkey I've ever seen? And no, it's not the one at the beach when I was in university here that playfully leapt onto my shoulder and tried to get romantic with my ear. This one is one of those things that happens to you and it's like a split second. Your camera is around your neck and you're on this old rickety train chugging past the scene. So there's no way you're going to capture the image. But yet it is so intense that you know you're never going to forget it either. Some years ago, and I'm not kidding, when I was on this very rickety old train, riding through the stunning mountains and valleys of the Minami Alps, or the Southern Alps, the train was this retro-looking thing, and all the windows were wide open. It was autumn, and the scenery was gorgeous, bright red and golden yellow leaves, this nice chill in the air. So I've put my camera down for a moment and I'm leaning out the window somewhat, not too far because we're so close to the forest that I could reach out and grab the limbs. I'm kind of mesmerized with the sound of the train just as we turn this corner. And there, I don't know, like two arms lengths away are several very old gravestones. I don't know if you've ever seen old Ohaka in Japan, but there are very long stone rectangles. These were particularly big. And on the biggest one, the one closest to me, sat the hugest freaking monkey I have ever seen, just sitting there. He's all brown, gray, furry, red-faced, bright hazel eyes, staring right at me. I mean, we made eye contact, like, for a little bit too long. We both turned our heads to keep it as the train chugged on past. Something just shot through me fear being part of it, but also this monkey dude, he just had this aura, this real quiet wisdom or resting power. I can still see him, and I wonder how he's doing these days. Anyway, Saru monkeys. I did a show on monkeys and monkey lore way back in episode four. There I briefly mentioned the three wise monkeys, as they're called in the West, but only briefly. In the episode before that, episode 3, I talked about a fascinating, if strange, kind of folk belief that is also going to tie into our story today. 
I was asked to do this show on the Three Wise Monkeys, and since I always felt I didn't finish everything I wanted to say about the creatures, I thought that would be a great idea. So let's dive back in. First, there is a debate on exactly where the Three Wise Monkeys originated. They can be found in India. Mahatma Gandhi was quite fond of them, and I read somewhere that he had a small see-no-evil, hear-no-evil, speak-no-evil statue, and it was one of his very few possessions. China's Confucius also wrote about the idea, although no monkeys were involved. His version went something like this. Look not at what is contrary to propriety. Listen not to what is contrary to propriety. Speak not what is contrary to propriety, and make no movement which is contrary to propriety. In the 8th century, Buddhist monks brought this proverb to Japan, and that last one, the number four, make no movement which is contrary to propriety, wasn't used for some reason or another. Why ditch the do no evil? It kind of feels like it's the most important one, right? Well, my guess is, and I could be wrong here, when it's portrayed via monkey, the animal is shown covering his nether region, which, I don't know, changes the kid-friendly dynamic. It invites awkward questions, I don't know. Or perhaps three is just a luckier number than four in Japan, which we know is true. Anyway, here's where things got clever. Confucius's long sentences were translated into Japanese as Mizaru, Kikazaru, Iwazaru. Miru, or the character Mi, means to see or look. By adding Zaru to the end of the verb, you negate it. Don't see, don't look. The same goes with Kiku, to hear. Kikazaru, don't hear. And Iu becomes Iwazaru, don't speak. The cute part comes when you realize that saru, the word for monkey, sounds like zaru, that negating thing. So all those images you see with the three monkeys with their paws covering their eyes, mouth, and ears, it's a play on words or a Japanese pun. So while the thought was there, Confucius did write about it earlier. I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying that it looks like the wise words being portrayed by Dent of Cute Monkey started in Japan. For all you language students, is there something curious you notice about how the Japanese was translated into English? You're right. There is no mention of the word evil in the Japanese version. Just Mizaru, Kikazaru, Iwazaru. Not seeing, not hearing, not speaking. Also, in Japanese, they're called the three monkeys, sanzaru. The word wise isn't in there at all. One of the most famous depictions of the three monkeys is at Toshogu in Nikko. This grand shrine was built in 1617 and dedicated to the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu. One of the many buildings attached to the shrine was a sacred stable, And what would you want to decorate a sacred stable with? Why, monkeys, of course. I'll get to that in a minute, but first back to Toshogu's sacred stable. Over the doors in the eaves of the stable are eight beautifully carved scenes that represent the way of living as told by monkeys. For example, the first panel shows a mama monkey looking off into the distance, and this means that she's wishing for a happy future for her children. But it's in the second panel where we find our three simian friends doing their see-no-evil, hear-no-evil, speak-no-evil shtick. It simply means that when raising your baby monkeys, or children as the case may be, you don't want them to see, hear, or say bad things. That's the goal. That kind of leads into how some people think that the see-no-evil or hear-no-evil part means that if you see or hear something terrible you should turn a blind eye. Actually, no. It's more like, don't listen to words that can lead to evil behavior, don't see bad deeds as natural, and don't say evil things. Oh, and before I forget, why put images of monkeys on a stable? 
Well, I talked about this a little bit in the monkey lore episode. But the more you dig around, the more you'll find monkeys and horses have a special relationship in Japan, with monkeys believed to be protectors of horses. Monkeys were often kept in or near stables, and when a new stable was being built or at the beginning of the new year, you'd have a kind of ceremony in which a monkey came and did a lucky dance. If a monkey dies, why hang up its bones in the stable? It's a thing. But let's get to the funky part. There is a very old tradition in Japan that comes from Chinese Taoism and other folk beliefs. It's called Koshin. You'll remember I talked about this in episode 3. But I'll give you the gist of it here real quick. People who follow the Koshin tradition believe there are days of great misfortune that occur six times a year, or every 60 days. They also believe that inside all of us reside three worms, sometimes called three corpses, other times called three death bringers. They're called sanshi in Japanese. So, during those unlucky days, after we fall asleep, these three worms or corpses or death bringers, as the case may be, escape our bodies and shoot up to visit the court of destiny, which it so happens is ruled by the emperor of heaven, Tente. The three worms' purpose? To report all our sins. Depending on the extent of our transgressions, Tente might decide to shorten our lives or make us ill. One way to keep those Sanshi from making a break for it is to stay awake all night long on those designated days. But what does any of that have to do with our three monkey friends? Well, for one, the kanji for Koshin is ko, which is an old character that is associated with metal, and Shin, an old character for monkey. But there's more monkey business. The Japanese version of Koshin has always been intertwined with the Tendai sect of Buddhism. It's actually thought that it was those early Tendai monks, Saicho, Ennin, and Enchin, who brought it over from China back in the 800s. But anyway, monkeys. Koshin is associated with Tendai Buddhism, and Tendai is associated with this truly cool tantric deity named Shomen Kongo. While you'll run across some variations, mostly you'll find him furiously angry, six arms waving, standing on some pitiful-looking beast with a brightly colored blue or green face. Note the characters for showmen literally mean blue face. But what's that at his feet? Yep, you guessed it. It's our three fuzzy friends. The three wise monkeys. We just said one way to stop the Sanshi worm, corpse informers, from leaving our body was to stay up all night long on the days they're able to escape. Another way is to have the Shomen Kongo help make those nasty, tattletelling Sanchi sick to prevent them from reporting our misdeeds. A neat aside, Shomen Kongo also performs other feats of healing. For example, he could help prevent attacks from strange creatures, help alleviate breathing problems, cure eye diseases, and get rid of your tuberculosis, to name a few. Remember I said he's blue? Well, it's thought that the blue color signifies that he's absorbing people's illness into his own body. If you're ever in Nara at Todaiji, you can find the oldest image of Shomen Kongo in Japan as a wooden statue. It's from the 10th century. Also, in case you didn't guess from the description, he's originally from India. Okay, so let's tie all this up. Having the three monkeys who can't see, hear, or speak associated with the Koshin ritual meant that somehow those traits get passed on to the Sanshi. Remember, the three worms are the three corpses are the three death bringers. So when they zoom off to meet Tente, 
they realize that they didn't see anything bad you did and they didn't hear anything bad you did. And most definitely, they suddenly can't speak, so they can't report anything bad you did. So you're safe. Something I found really interesting is that the Kolshin belief really took a hit in 1872 and after, when with the Meiji Restoration, there was this new law passed called the Shinbutsu Bunli, or the separation of Buddhism and Shintoism. Well, before, there was this kind of cool mix of both religions, giving and borrowing at will. It was decided that they needed to be separate, and all folk beliefs should be disavowed. Roads were also widened around this time, and while there used to be thousands of these Shomon Kongo and Koshin characters and images carved on these small stone statues or markers, most of them got destroyed. However, if you ever find yourself in the countryside in Japan, wandering down narrow roads off the beaten track, you could very well stumble across one of these steles dedicated to the Koshin ritual. They're probably very worn, but you might be able to make out the kanji or the carved image of Shomon Kongo with his many arms, and if you're really lucky, the three little monkeys below. True story. I was perfectly freaked out about a year ago when I was walking between the rice fields near my new place, and I found not one, but two of these little markers. There's no image of Shomon Kongo on them, but there were three characters, Ko Shin being one, Ko Sho being two, and Grave. Which invites a whole bunch of new questions. Why Ko Shin Grave? Okay, I will stop here for today. I want to thank you so much for listening, for your support, for leaving reviews, for sending me wonderful messages, and for telling your friends and family about the show. Thank you especially to my patrons because you are literally what keeps the podcast going. You guys keep an eye out for this month's bedtime story. It's going to be about Mount Fuji, a Mount Fuji legend. I just haven't decided which one to retell yet. Plus, I'll be putting up the yellow wallpaper and Mask of the Red Death minus the intro before the end of the month, too. Thank you again, everyone. Have a lovely two weeks, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. You've just reached the end of another episode of Uncanny Japan. Perhaps you'd like more. A monthly folktale translated and retold by me. The occasional binarily mic'd soundscape like the ones you hear on this show. Or recipes, behind-the-curtain episodes, homemade postcards, and more. If you're interested in that or supporting the show in any way, please search for Uncanny Japan and Patreon. We've got a wonderful group over there. Thank you again for listening, supporting, reviewing, and telling your friends about the show. My name is Teresa Matsura, and I will talk to you again soon.